American artist and teacher J. Alden Weir once said, A young man came to me once and said he couldn't sell anything. I told him to throw away his brushes, go out in the country and paint with a stick. Look at nature and get the paint on anyhow. He was disgusted, thought it was fool talk. But the next I heard of him, he had done it actually gone out and tried to get the character of the scene and daub it on the canvas. And he got the real thing. On a country road 50 miles from Manhattan, an artist is setting up to paint at Weir Farm. You come in here as an artist, and it's so quiet and gentle, and it's asking for somebody to, to say something about it. An artist needs both solitude and solidarity, and Weir Farm uh, provided that for me. The opportunity to be part of a larger uh, artistic tradition this is the legacy of Julian Alden Weir, who painted this landscape over 100 years ago and helped nurture a new movement in American art. Since that time, the farm has stood as a sanctuary for the appreciation of nature and artistic expression. Born in 1852, Julian Alden Weir first learned painting from his father, Robert Walter Weir, a renowned artist who taught drawing at West Point Military Academy. Julian then continued his studies at the prominent National Academy of Design in New York City. He soon developed into a skilled portrait and still life painter, exhibiting in New York City and abroad. It was while studying in Paris in 1877 that he first came in contact with the emerging movement called Impressionism. He attended an exhibition featuring paintings by Claude Monet, Pierre-Auguste Renoir, and others, whose innovative open brushwork suggested motion and portrayed the shimmering effects of sunlight. They painted outside, on plein air, in an attempt to capture people and landscape in candid, natural moments. But Weir was not impressed. He wrote to his family, I never in my life saw more horrible things. They do not observe drawing nor form, but give an impression of what they call nature. It was worse than the Chamber of Horrors. I was there about a quarter of an hour and left with a headache. It was hard for many in the art establishment to respect this experimental work, and Weir was no exception. He had spent five years in Paris, studying the academic style at the venerable Paris School of Fine Arts, the École de Beaux-Arts. Learning how to render with the greatest of accuracy the smallest details of the human form, often from reproductions of classic sculpture. The Impressionists, meanwhile, worked outdoors, freely depicting everyday subjects and their own perceptions of nature, light, and color, using loose, rapid brushstrokes. Weir returned to New York City and continued his work as a portrait painter in the academic style. It was a time of growth in the United States, a new era of urban expansion and industrialization. Like many artists, Weir responded to the steady disappearance of the rural landscape by looking with a romantic eye to the countryside. He was planning to build a rustic lodge in the Adirondacks. When, in 1882, business associate and art dealer Irwin Davis unexpectedly offered Weir another property, a farm encompassing 153 acres in Branchville, Connecticut. On his first visit, Weir was inspired to paint a small watercolor scene, which illustrated the farm's stone walls and meadows. 
The painting also captured an unexpected fondness for the landscape. Weir acquired the property in exchange for a painting he had recently purchased and $10. Weir's friend, C.E.S. Wood, recounted, Mr. Davis, judging by the rocks, thought he had the better of the artist. And Weir, judging by the inexhaustible beauty of woods, fields, hills, ponds, granite boulders, and stone walls which he painted over and over again, knew that he had the better of the man of business. The following year, Weir married Anna Dwight Baker, daughter of a wealthy and prominent Connecticut family. Anna was an intelligent and cultured 19-year-old who, like her husband, enjoyed welcoming guests into their home. As the years passed and the Weir family grew, their summer retreat became known to their friends as a place of hospitality, warmth, and laughter. His friend, Duncan Phillips, observed. It is pleasant to think of Weir's handsome silvered head in the firelight. His eyes merry with anecdote or softened with sentiment. His big laugh was a kind that warmed the heart. Weir spent more time in Branchville and found that painting outside helped him capture the ever-changing New England landscape on his canvas. Weir began exploring other painting techniques, including those of the Impressionists. His brush strokes grew looser and his compositions became less rigid. Weir had found a new freedom. Painting has a greater charm to me than ever before. And I feel that I can enjoy studying any phase of nature which before I had restricted to preconceived notions of what ought to be. By the time the paintings of the French Impressionists made their debut in New York in 1888, it was clear that Weir's artistic sensibilities had evolved. Whereas he had once described an Impressionist exhibit as a chamber of horrors, he now wrote in a letter to his brother, It was the most interesting exhibition for an artist to see that we have yet had. Several of Weir's artist friends were similarly enthusiastic about the freedom of expression made available through impressionistic techniques. John Twachtman and Child Hassam often came to visit Weir on the farm, as did John Singer Sargent. I often think of that last day and night of mine when you carried us out of the heat of New York to your dear country house. Painting on plein air at Weir's farm, these artists broke free of their studios and the restrictions of the past, applying the techniques of the French Impressionists to their own painting of the American countryside. they tended to paint in a less abstract, more realistic style, known today as American Impressionism. Weir's farm became a place of artistic exploration, a retreat honoring the brilliance of nature, the home of an American master. For the rest of his life, Weir would continue to play a leading role in the art community. He served on the board of the Metropolitan Museum of Art as president of the National Academy of Design and co-founder of the Ten American Painters. Yet his greatest satisfaction always came from mentoring and supporting his fellow artists. Julian Alden Weir died in 1919 yet his farm remained a refuge for artists. The property passed to his daughter, Dorothy, and another daughter, Cora, came to live in an adjacent farmhouse. While Dorothy painted in her father's studio,
Cora reshaped the grounds with stone walls and gardens. Dorothy later married the renowned sculptor Mahan Rai Young, who worked here for 27 years. He created his most important public works in a second studio he had built at Weir Farm. Young also reveled in the landscape of the Branchville Farm and, like Weir before him, often sketched scenes of everyday life. Young also mentored other artists. In fact, upon his death in 1957, Weir Farm was sold to a local artist couple he had befriended, Sperry and Doris Andrews. The Andrews family kept the artistic tradition alive and were instrumental in saving the land from encroaching development. Thanks to the artistic generations of the past, the home, studios, farm buildings, and landscape integral to Weir's artistic vision have survived remarkably intact. Today, Weir Farm is preserved by the joint efforts of the Weir Farm Trust and National Park Service. On the land where Weir and other artists lived and worked for over 120 years, contemporary artists are provided with similar opportunities and inspiration. Some that I want to redo, mm -hmm. and I want to have an addition. There's something quite compelling about working at a site where other American artists have worked. Walking in the in sort of tradition of other artists is something that I value, something that connects me. It is a tradition felt by all visitors to the park. Julian Alden Weir's celebration of light, color, and nature established a legacy that became powerful enough to protect the landscape that inspired it. He found the world beautiful, his daughter Dorothy wrote, and he spent his life showing others the visions he had seen.